Imagine you had unlimited power to do whatever you wanted. If someone made you angry or frustrated, you could have them killed or banished from society with no consequences for you. You want money? You could literally have all the money in the world given to you, no questions asked. Want to get drunk? You could have wine brought to you continuously, forever. You could have sex with anyone you want, whenever you want. If you had this power, you would be the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. He was the Emperor of Rome which basically meant that he had full executive control over the entire known world at the time. There were other civilizations around, but the Romans didn't really know about them. So he was basically the god king of the entire world. He had life and death power over everyone. He could literally have whatever he wants and do whatever he wants. And he had this power for 19 years. But the funny thing about Marcus Aurelius was that he didn't do any of that indulging. He showed an insane amount of restraint. Despite this unbelievable power and temptation, Marcus Aurelius was a good emperor. He didn't spend his time indulging in pleasures. He spent his time trying to be the best possible emperor he could be. He's the one exception to Lord Acton's famous quote, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. He had absolute power, but he didn't corrupt absolutely. But how did he do it? Well, what the with the title of the vi Stoicism, as you might imagine from that story, involves a rejection of pleasure. For the Stoics, a wise man lives in accordance with nature. The wise man isn't afraid of suffering, he isn't afraid of pain, he isn't afraid of death, he isn't afraid of poverty, and he generally isn't afraid of anything that most people are afraid of. The only thing the wise man is afraid of is failing to live up to his moral responsibilities. I'm not living up to my moral responsibility! <laughs> the reason the Stoics don't have ordinary fears is because they only concern themselves with things that are under their control. You can't control if a tiger attacks you. You can't control the weather. You can't control other people or the society around you. You can't control pain, sickness, or death. The only thing you can control is you, your will, your intentions, and the type of person you embody. There's no reason to be afraid of pain, death, ridicule, or anything like that, because you can't control that. Why worry about something you can't change? The only thing you should worry about is if you're doing what is right and living up to your full potential. An interesting aspect about Stoicism is that it is deeply universal. It's something anybody can adopt and apply to their own lives. You don't need to be an all-powerful Roman emperor. The best evidence for this is the second most famous ancient Stoic philosopher, Epictetus. Epictetus was a slave. He was at the polar opposite end of society's hierarchy at the time, but yet they were both able to practice the same philosophy. You aren't responsible for your position in the social hierarchy, so it shouldn't be a concern since you can't control it. All you have to worry about, a Stoic would say, is to live up to your fullest potential, regardless of your conditions. The Stoics say that you should stop complaining. There's nothing to complain about. There's only two kinds of things. The kinds of things you can control, and the kinds of things you can't control. If you can't control it, complaining about it is a waste of time. And if you can control it, stop complaining about it and control it already so it stops bothering you. This all might seem a little harsh, but it's convincing because both Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus did truly enact this philosophy. It didn't come from a place of hypocrisy. It was fully authentic, and that's what makes it so persuasive. There are a number of techniques you can use to apply Stoic philosophy to your own life. That makes Stoicism somewhat unique as a philosophy, because it's something you can actually use. That's part of the reason I think there's been a revived interest in Stoicism lately in the cultural zeitgeist. It's pretty hard to use metaphysical philosophy, like Descartes' Cogito or Immanuel Kant's thing in itself, but Stoicism is something you can actually apply to your day-to-day -day life. The Stoic philosopher Seneca, in one of his letters, put forward some advice. Set aside now, and then a number of days, during which you will be content with the plainest food, and very little of it, and with rough, coarse clothing, and ask yourself, is this what one used to dread? It is in times of security that the spirit should be preparing itself to deal with difficult times. At the end of it, believe me, Lucilius, you will revel in being sated for a penny, and will come to see that security from care is not dependent on fortune. I'm not saying you should actually do this, 
but this connects to a stoic technique called negative visualization. This basically involves thinking about something bad that could happen. If you're watching this video, I can probably assume that you aren't deaf. Think for a second about what it would be like if you were deaf. Absolutely no hearing. You can make this more vivid by plugging your ears for a few seconds. Doing this can remind you how fortunate you are to be able to hear. The next time you're listening to music or having a conversation with someone, you might be reminded how fantastic it is to be able to hear things. You can apply this technique to relationships and friendships too. Imagine for a second what it would be like if your best friend suddenly disappeared off the face of the earth, or if they never existed in the first place. The next time you encounter that person, you might appreciate them more and feel grateful that you know them. You won't take them for granted in the same way that you did before. To be clear, this technique is not dwelling on how things might go wrong and becoming anxious about it. It's allowing yourself, for a brief moment, to contemplate how things could be worse and then returning to life as normal. This makes you feel more grateful for the life you have. It's a kind of reset exercise for your hedonic treadmill. Most of the time, we compare ourselves to the idealized life of people on Instagram, people in advertisements, etc. This just makes us feel worse and inferior. But we can also compare ourselves to people living in developing countries with no access to clean drinking water, or to people in the past who didn't have the modern technological luxuries that we do. This framing makes us feel grateful and privileged, which is a lot nicer than feeling worse and inferior. Another useful technique is the last time. Consider for a second, anything you do might be the last time you ever do it. There's always the chance that you get hit by a bus tomorrow and die, or randomly have a brain aneurysm. This puts a positive spin on whatever you're doing, even if it's boring or banal. If you're in a car with your friend and you get stuck in traffic, you might think, Oh, God damn it! traffic. This sucks. This is going to make our trip way longer. But you could also consider that this might be the last time you ever do this. This might be the last time you ever drive a car. This might be the last time you ever listen to this song. This might be the last time you ever see this friend. That example reveals that this technique can also be applied to relationships, not just activities. If you meet with someone, this might be the last time you ever see them. This causes you to be more grateful for that person and appreciate the value they bring to your life. If that relationship does end, you will have fewer regrets than you otherwise would because you'll have savored the moments you spent together and cherished the relationship that you had with them. The following techniques can be implemented when you encounter setbacks. We run into setbacks pretty much every day, and most of them are micro setbacks, like stubbing your toe or running out of coffee. But we also encounter major setbacks, like being diagnosed with some terrible illness or getting your house robbed. The stoic teaching about setbacks is that you shouldn't be concerned about the setback itself. You should be concerned with your response to it. You usually can't control whether a setback will happen to you, but you can control how you respond to it, so that's what you should be concerned with. Another technique is story time framing. When you encounter a setback or a major inconvenience in life, at that moment, consider the story you'll be able to tell someday about that event. I have a personal experience with this technique. A few years ago, I was moving into an apartment with a close friend of mine. We packed a bunch of furniture into a trailer and set off for the three hour drive to our apartment in the other town. It was a bright sunny day when we left, not a cloud in the sky. About halfway through the drive, a torrential downfall of rain began. We had nothing covering the furniture in the trailer, so the couches, desks, and bookshelves got drenched. When we finally arrived, it was still raining, and we moved all the furniture into the apartment in the worst possible conditions. Everything was slippery, the fake leather on the couch was peeling off, we were both soaking wet, and on paper, this would completely suck. But funnily enough, we were actually in pretty good spirits. We were laughing with each other about the absurdity of how unfortunate the whole situation was. Internally, I was thinking about how funny this story would be able to tell to our other housemates in the future. The rain could have filled me with a sense of frustration and anger at forces I had no control over, but instead it filled me with a comedic joy. A hardline stoic might consider this strategy a form of complaining, but I think it's different from that. If you tell someone a story about a setback you encountered and how you overcame it, that might allow them to relate to you in a deeper way. They might have encountered similar setbacks before. If they haven't, your story might provide them with advice for how to deal with a similar situation they might encounter in the future. The last technique I'll mention is the test strategy. When you encounter a setback, you can frame it like a challenge. It's like a video game. 
and the setback is the boss. You defeat the boss by not getting angry or frustrated while you're handling the situation. It's a test of character and ingenuity, which makes you stronger and more resilient, like leveling up. Encountering a setback and dealing with it successfully without getting angry is like lifting weights to make your muscles stronger. It makes you more effective at controlling your emotions and dealing with challenges. Instead of thinking about a setback as an annoying thing you have to deal with, Think about it as an opportunity to practice handling challenges, and as an added bonus, you might get a good story to tell.